The gentleman from Thomson Reuters. Hello, Daniel Stanton, Thomson Reuters. Um, do you have any plans in the future to, to become uh, more transparent and granular in your reporting uh, along the, the lines of Norway's uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund, for example? Uh, we don't try to emulate everybody. We do what is comfortable for us. Uh, our main uh, purpose is to explain ourselves um, and to provide information which are relevant. Are you, are you likely to change which information you've uh, revealed to the public? Sorry? Uh, are you likely to change or increase the uh, range well, of information think, you revealed uh, to the public? I think we're very comfortable with, uh, with the level of disclosure that we have given, uh, which is more than uh, most uh, investors uh, in the private uh, space. Yes, go ahead. Straits Times. Hi, uh, El Elvin from the Straits Times. Uh, can I just ask, what did Tomasic do as an active manager in the last 12 months that distinguishes it from, you know, just a, a, a passive investor? Mm. We invested $9 billion, uh, including $3 billion of our in the rights issues. We divested $16 billion. Uh, I think that's a lot of work. And that's very active program. BT? I'm Lee Sen from Business Times. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is, you said that uh, going forward, you're going to overweight Asia. Um, are you, you know, worried about the uh, possibility of, you know, bubble uh, building in the, some of the assets, real estate? Yes, or? there are some signs of that. Um, as I said, when we are looking at overweighting Asia, uh, here we are talking in terms of the longer term, uh, not necessary for the short term. And uh, as we have mentioned uh, earlier, uh, some of my senior colleagues have mentioned earlier, uh, we maintain the full flexibility to shift um, our stance. Um, just to clarify, so that could mean you could be, um, you know, selling some of the Asian assets, which... Possible. Not that I'm saying that we will, but I'm just saying it's possible. Yes, Costas. Um, I have one more question, please. Um, have you changed your stance after what happened with uh, Merrill Lynch and Bank of America of becoming a more active investor when you have such stakes as 11% at one t time in Merrill Lynch and then 17%. From what we understand, you guys didn't even know that there were talks of Merrill uh, being sold to Bank of America. I just was, were caught by surprise. We also hear that Ken Lewis didn't even know what Tomasic is. So Sorry? The Ken Lewis didn't even know what Tomasic is. So, uh, especially where he was coming from. So, yeah, but my question is, are you going to be taking a more active role if you have such big stakes in major Western companies, whether it's financial institutions or something else? Um, we have said uh, many times, uh, ever since we published our, uh, our uh, Tomasic Review in uh, 2004, governance is a very important uh, issue with us. And in respect of our portfolio companies, we leave the management and the guidance of their business to their boards. We are not involved. And that's the stance that uh, we will maintain. The lady from Thomson Reuters. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, this is Minerva of Thomson Reuters. I'm just getting away from financial institutions. I just want to ask about your um, divestments in, uh, in the power sector, energy sector. You, I mean, Temasek has been described as being very successful in divesting its three Jenkos. Um, I'm just wondering whether you're going into other sectors of the industry like oil and gas, um, exploration and productions. Any plans on that side and aspect of the industry? Uh, we Thank think you. in the long run, resources is an area that we obviously must look at. Uh, but how and when... Uh, will depend on, on 
on, I suppose, the market. Uh, as an example, we have been looking uh, at Africa as well as the Middle East for the last four years, but we never found opportunities that we thought uh, was worthwhile for us to get in because the valuations were very, very high. Um, but looking at the Middle East and Africa, uh, essentially our interests would be driven by our uh, wanting an exposure, a larger exposure to the resources. Um, gentlemen at the back. Just, just a, can I just have a follow-up question, though, um, slightly? Um, you're overweight on Asia. Can I just have your opinion on how you will be investing in countries like India and China, which are the two countries leading, I think, recovery of the, of, of the uh, global economy? Thanks. Um, Simon can supplement uh, that, but let me just try to put in sort of broad perspectives. Uh, we think that China, um, I think most people think of China today as uh, they've passed the inflection point, unlike in the 19, 19, early 1990s, where they was, weren't certain whether they'll go market economy or whether they will sort of fall back on, uh, on a planned economy. Uh, so today, I would say China is past that. Uh, they have demonstrated a very strong um, capacity and capability to integrate with the global economy. Uh, I think their decision in the uh, mid-1990s to join the WTO uh, was a big impetus. Uh, they are transforming their SOEs. If you look at the SOEs today, uh, they are profit generating compared to the 1990s where they, they, they were not well run. So today you see a very vibrant um, economy where the state level, uh, they understand what market economy means. In the private sector, the private-owned enterprises or the POEs, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of verve and vitality. Uh, so if you look at China over the long run, uh, we think the potential is there and is very strong. India is another uh, economy that uh, we believe has very, very deep potential. Uh, they started off differently from, uh, from the Chinese. They were not going from a socialist planned economy into a market economy. They have always been uh, uh, open, uh, 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 ostensibly a market economy. But what has happened is that instead of closing in previously, they have liberalized a lot, and that has released a lot of uh, entrepreneurial energies uh, among their people among their uh, large corporations as well as among the smaller corporations. If you look at a company like Bharti, this is a first-generation founder uh, who has done very well, grew with uh, India, and now is expanding beyond India's shores. And you see many, many of these types of uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, in India at every level in different states. So we think that India going forward, again, India has passed an inflection point. I think today the Indians are very comfortable to be connected to the world. They are no longer afraid of the world. Uh, they are out to grow very, very strong companies. Um, and so we think there are lots of opportunities in these two economies uh, over the long term. The short term, there may be some risks. Uh, as uh, some of you mentioned, there could be you know, short-term bubbles and asset bubbles and stuff like that. Um, but if we look at the longer term, and if we invest based on fundamental views, uh, rather than just trying to catch the, uh, catch the momentum of the market, uh, I think we will do well by uh, focusing on these two economies. I think as an additional perspective, I'll just bring you back to the distribution of our portfolio, which represents the investment in the underlying assets, and some of those, of course, are major positions held by portfolio companies in which we're invested. So as you think about our exposure to China and India, you also have to think about in the context of what our, our portfolio companies are doing in those countries. And I think uh, com companies particularly such as Standard Chartered Bank, um, Singtel, Capital Land are very well positioned, uh, both in terms of their market position, in terms of... As, as well as in terms of their financial position to capitalise on those opportunities. So just a reminder that we participate at two levels. Direct investments we make 
and also the investments via our, in particular, our larger portfolio companies.